We're very eager to get going. Thank you. I'd ask you all to please stand for the King's Anthem. Dr. Davis, our head of school. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, today is one of those very rare special days at ISP when we'll have the privilege to listen to and interact with a person who has contributed significantly to the, the progress of humankind. Professor Harold Zerhausen, a Nobel laureate for medicine, will address us shortly as part of the fourth ASEAN event series, Bridges, Dialogues Towards a Culture of Peace, which the International Peace Foundation is hosting under the common patronage of 25, sorry, 21 Nobel Peace Prize laureates in cooperation with various national and international partners. The International Peace Foundation has been continuously hosted in Thailand, the Philippines, Malaysia, Cambodia, and now Vietnam since 2003. 38 Nobel laureates and 18 other keynote speakers and artists, including Dr. Hans Blix, Jackie Chan, the Reverend Je Jesse Jackson, Jesse Norman, Vanessa May, Oliver Stone, Dan Anita Roddick, and Dr. Jane Wolfenson have also participated in these events. Now the aim of Bridges is to facilitate and strengthen dialogue and communication between societies in Southeast Asia with their multiple cultures and faiths, as well as with peoples in other parts of the world to promote understanding and trust. As an international school that's incredibly committed to global citizenship, we're honored to be hosting Professor Harold Zohausen and to be part of the International Peace Foundation's work. With around one million students now studying in international schools around the world, probably the equivalent to uh, a school system in a small country, international schools are the embodiment of intercultural understanding and will increasingly play an important role in building bridges among nations and cultures. Without any further ado, I'll now turn you over to Amy Elliott, our Student Council Vice President, who will introduce formally our distinguished guest. Thank you. Hello, my name is Amy Elliott, and it is my great honor to formally introduce Professor Harold Zerhausen. Professor ha Professor Hausen received the 2008 Nobel Prize for Medicine in recognition of his profound discovery that the human papilloma, papilloma virus causes cervical cancer, which, led, which is the second most common cancer in women. He went on to identify the primary strands of the virus and that carry the disease, followed by the development of vaccines that protect against the virus, and thus is essentially a vaccine for cervical cancer. Professor Hausen has gone on to be the editor-in-chief of the International Jour Journal of Cancer and the author of the book, Infectious Causing, Infections Causing Human Cancer. What I personally want to relate today is the amazing opportunity that we as students have to listen to Prof Professor Hausen, someone who has dedicated his life to science and medicine. 
Even if science is not your cup of tea, there is much to learn today, like about the drive it takes to become the best in your field. I do not have to emphasize the importance of fighting to find a cure for or a vaccine for cancer. I'm sure all of us, someone, I'm sure all of us know someone who is fighting against cancer, who has survived cancer, or has even passed away from cancer. Today, Pro Professor Hausen has come here with the hopes that he could contribute to your education, but more importantly, to inspire you and to make you realize that it could be us, as that we as students who in 50 years time may be standing here like Professor Hausen and telling of our research and our discoveries. With that in mind, please make the most of this opportunity. Listen, ask questions, and please give a warm welcome to Professor Van Housen. Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you for your very warm welcome, which we found here today. It's indeed, for me specifically, a great pleasure to be here at this school. I'm a relatively frequent visitor to Thailand in the past due to a couple of commitments which I had here over the years. And I must say every of these visits has been very delightful and certainly this includes this one very much. Now, I thought what I would do today is to give you a very brief uh, in-look or outlook of a uh, couple of years which I worked in this field. And I hope that we end up in a hopefully lively discussion with questions which you may ask concerning specific problems which are either, which are either related to cancer in general or to the more specific themes on which you are working right now. Uh, let me very briefly introduce myself. I studied medicine in Germany initially and after an internship went in a postdoctoral period at an institute of microbiology in Dusseldorf. I went to the United States for three and a half years in a break here, and subsequently to uh, uh, Würzburg in Germany. I could build up a new institute of biology in Allen in 1972, and later on to Freiburg. And for 20 years, between 1983 and 2003, I was chairman of the German Cancer Research Center in Heidelberg. And since 10 years, I'm happy, I believe, a fully active, still fully active emeritus of that, unit, of that place. And uh, fortunately, I have a chance to continue my work there. Basically, I became very early interested in science and a bit later, specifically in cancer. My interest in science started already as a schoolboy when I was reading some biographies of some of the discoverers in the early, when was it, the early, late 19th century, early 20th century. And uh, in cancer, my interest turned to cancer because I realized as a student that there exist bacteria which, upon infection by viruses, pick up the genetic material of those viruses, and this changes their properties. And it seems to have happened in the history of bacteria like diphtheria bacterium or cholera bacterium, which picked up their toxins, apparently due to the infection by a virus, and changed their properties. This indeed triggered, in a way, the idea that cancer may, might be related to something similar, namely that the pickup of genetic material from an external infectious agent would change the property of the respective type of cell and turn it into a cancer cell. This idea followed me through my entire career. And indeed, I worked on this type of question during a couple, I'm almost reluctant to tell you how many, but more than 50 years by now, five decades. And uh, in a way, um, the idea was a bit naive in the beginning because the situation is clearly more complicated than I thought at that time. But on the whole, uh, it turned out that there are indeed a number of agents which contribute to human cancer. And if you look at it globally right now, 
we can roughly calculate that about 21% of the global cancer incidence is linked to infections. Some are quite geographically limited. For instance, the liver fluke infections here in Thailand are quite regional in a way, which cause a specific type of, of liver cancer, the so-called cholangiocarcinomas. Uh, others, like other parasitic infections, which cause contribute cancer, are more prevalent, for instance, in Egypt, where they cause the most frequent cancer, bladder cancer, at all. But there are others which are globally distributed. And liver cancer in general terms, also with some regional clusters, but also um, cervical carcinomas clearly belonging to the latter category. And the AIDS infections, of course, contribu contributed greatly globally also to the emergence of cancers which are activated due to an infection which suppresses our immune system, the AIDS infection. So in a way, we have a wide variety. And this kind of wide variety of agents which cause cancer permitted, in a way, for the first time, to develop preventive measurements against cancer, namely vaccinations. But it's not only vaccinations which now are available to prevent two major human cancers, namely the hepatitis B-linked liver cancer and the, uh, cervical, the papillomavirus-linked cervical cancers. Also new drugs became available which help us in some instances where persons are infected for lifetime by specific agents like hepatitis C virus which pose a high risk subsequently also for development of liver cancer, that we can interfere with the presence of these types of, of uh, viruses and reduce the level substantially or even eliminate them completely by medical treatment. And thus also in all likelihood, it will only be seen in a couple of years to prevent these types of cancers, which are very nasty cancers. If you look at it globally right now, we can see that there is a steady decrease, light decrease, in the cancer mortality. Less people die of cancer due to the improved treatment procedures which are presently being available. But at the same time, there's an increase in cancer incidence, which means cancer occurs at a higher frequency. This is in part due to the fact that we live longer right now. During the past decades, in many countries of the world, there was an increase in life expectancy of, a, of about one and a half years per decade. And since cancer is mainly a disease of elderly people, in spite of the fact that, of course, cancer occurs also in very young children as well, particularly specific forms of cancer, this increase in cancer incidence is mainly due, but apparently not completely due, to the longer lifetime of the, of the population worldwide. But we have to do something in order to avoid that this type of scissors go up between mortalities, dying of cancer, which is reduced, and the increased occurring occurrence of cancer on the other hand. And if we wish to avoid the latter, then we have to do something about prevention. And that's really my main message, which I'm trying to deliver everywhere whenever I talk, is look into prevention, look into the possibilities, how we can prevent cancer, because in each case, it's much more beneficial, it's much more cost effective to prevent cancer than to treat a cancer patient. In spite of the fact that it's of course important to treat cancer patients who suffer from this terrible disease. So, in uh, short, I worked on a number of different virus systems. When I started in 1962 to work in this field, there was not a single cancer linked to infectious events. Today, as I said before, slightly more than 20% of cancers are linked. And we, we believe that there's evidence, some epidemiological evidence in particular, which points to the fact that probably more cancers might be linked to infection and more research has to be done 
in order to clarify the situation. And we can only treat cancer sufficiently well, we can only prevent it very well, and diagnose it is much, it's much better when we know the causes of the disease. I think I will stop here, and hopefully if you have questions, or I hope at least you will have questions, I will try my best to answer them. We will now open the floor to questions from the student body. If you have a question you would like to ask, please line up behind the two mics on either side of the auditorium. Only four people can be in the line at a time, and once you receive the answer to your question, you can sit down in the aisle. Others can, can then come to take your place. So if you have a que uh, the four biology students who have a question, who can start off the questions, can come forward now. Um, so what does a vaccination consist of? Do are you, I can't see you. Right here. Okay, right. okay thank you. Um, so what does the vaccination consist of? Does it consist of antibodies or a small concentration of a disease for the body to develop its own immunity? Okay, so the question is what is given in the vaccination protocol for the papillomavirus vaccine specifically? Because in this case, uh, uh, the virus, the papillomavirus, consists of a protein shell, and it, within the shell it contains the genetic material. Now, the shell of this virus can be produced in other organisms by genetic engineering, uh, either by in yeast or in bacterial cells, and then the shells are being produced and they spontaneously assemble to which looks like a virus particle, they are called virus-like particles, but uh, exist of empty shells of protein uh, shells of this, uh, these particular viruses. So the, they are being purified and used for vaccination. And what happens is that they produce at a very high level antibodies specifically directed against the virus type against which the shell has been produced. So uh, if you inoculate it and the antibodies are being produced, then this person becomes protected against subsequent infections by the virus. The virus particles, before they enter the cell, are becoming neutralized by these antibodies and are unable to enter the cell and unable to proceed in a normal way of the infection. Now, if a person has been infected already, the situation is different because in an infected person, the genetic material of the virus has been taken up by the respective types of cells and persists there in some instances for years and years and years. And under those circumstances, the proteins which form the viral shell are not being formed at all. And therefore, the antibodies which are being produced are not protective at all. So it's important to vaccinate prior to the, ons in the best case, prior to the onset of sexual activity, and under those circumstances, the protection appears to be optimal. Apparently, in about 100% of cases, these high antibody levels are being formed. They persist for long periods of time. At this moment, we can only stay for 10 years, because the, vaccine, the first clinical trial started about 10 years ago, and the vaccine in many countries was licensed in 2006. But uh, in a way, it's... Uh, apparently protective against the precursor lesions of cervical cancer because that would need another lecture between infection and cancer development usually 15 to 25 years elapse for cervical cancer and so we will only know in 15 or 10 or 15 year, more years before statistically significant results come up that demonstrating that it protects also against cancer but in view of the fact that we can prevent the precursor lesions I think in this case it's quite clear that it will also in the end prevent cancer. Thank you. Um, uh, I have a second question. Um, if the HPV, H HPV may cause male reproductive issues, then why are HPV vaccination primarily aimed at female use? Primarily aimed at for primarily aimed for females. 
This is an excellent question. Thank you very much. I would have come to it anyway later on. Why do we vaccinate only females? In my opinion, it's a mistake to vaccinate only females. Boys should be vaccinated as well in the same age groups, preferentially at age groups between 9 and 14 years of age, because, of course, this is a sexually transmitted infection. And uh, it's mo in most societies in the world, the number of partners of males in the age group between 15 and 25 is higher than among females. A very good reason to vaccinate boys as well. But it's not the only reason, because there are two types of cancers caused by the same virus as the cervical cancer, which occur in males as well, and they occur in males even slightly more frequently, cancer of the anus and also cancer of the, of the back oropharyngeal region, cancer of the tonsils, are linked to a fairly large percentage to the same types of infections. And Although no long-standing clinical trials have yet been conducted, it is very likely that the vaccination will also prevent these types of cancers. One of the vaccines even prevents genital warts, and genital warts are a nasty problem for both genders. So for all these reasons, there's very good reason to support vaccination of boys as well. One of the major obstacles in vaccinating both genders is the high price of the vaccines. I think that needs to be reduced, and I'm emphasizing it whenever I talk. The price is too high right now. I know that it has been reduced due to the negotiation in some countries with the companies, but it still needs to be reduced further in order to reach a global vaccination level and clearly to include also boys. So thank you for the question. My answer is yes, boys need to be vaccinated as well. Do you have any other suspicions of other causes to cancer relating to viruses that we have not yet discovered? Yeah. Do you have any other suspicions of causes to cancer relating to viruses that we have not yet discovered? There are, clearly, there are clearly a couple of cancers which are quite interesting, which clearly need more studies whether they are linked to infections or not. First of all, we see that under conditions of immunosuppression in HIV-infected persons, a couple of cancers, cancers occur at high level, which are clearly caused by other viruses, like Epstein-Barr virus, the human herpes virus type 8, the so-called Merkel cell polyoma virus. They are increase, these cancers increase under conditions of immunosuppression. But there are a couple of other cancers which are also increased, which have not yet been linked with infections, like um, cancer of the, uh, uh, of the thyroid, cancers of the kidneys, and a couple of others which clearly deserve further studies where there might be an infectious background behind it. Secondly, another cancer is quite interesting for diff totally different reasons because human breast cancer occurs at reduced incidence under immunosuppression in AIDS patients, in organ allograft recipients. You have a lower rate of breast cancer incidence than in immunocompetent, immunoactive persons. And this is something which on the first glance looks contraintuitive. If we wouldn't have an agent in mice, which does exactly the same. It causes a memory gland cancer in mice. It's caused by a virus. And uh, we even understand the reason why immuno incompetence, so non-functioning of the immune system, is able to suppress this type of cancer because it uh, is initially taken up by lymphatic cells in the, in the colon, in the gut, in the so-called pious patches. And these cells start to be stimulated in growth. They produce what is called a superantigen and produce at the, large, at the same time large quantities of viral particles which are being eluted into the blood and the lymphatic system. And apparently the concentration of this virus is responsible for eventually reaching the mammary gland and causing there, after a specific event in the cell, 
the development of the mammary cancer in mice. Now, if you immunosuppress these animals, then the lymphatic cells are being suppressed. With other words, the production of virus goes down, and with it, the risk for tumor induction. We do not know whether human breast cancer has a similar type of, or type of origin of a lymphocyte, for instance, transmitted agent, but clearly an area which de deserves further studies. There are a couple of other tumors. I could go on for length, but I will limit it to these brief, briefly mentioning those. One is childhood leukemias, where we know that infections in the first year of life play a protective role in developing these childhood leukemias. And we believe that we can develop models which could explain it why these types of uh, infections protect due to the fact that uh, most of these infections are infections of the respiratory tract. And under those circumstances, produce a lot of antiviral substances called interferons, which suppress the virus production. And this could be one of the reasons. The other one, and these are the two types of cancers which interest us very much, is colon cancer, which is clearly linked to the consumption of red, so-called red meat, a meat which is roasted, barbecued, grilled, or even consumed rare or medium cooked only, and uh, where a number of epidemiological factors seem to point to a specific role of beef in this type of uh, colorectal cancer development. And we suspect strongly, we believe even we have some indirect evidence that there exist viruses which survive these types of procedures very well, which in combination with some chemicals produced during the barbecuing, roasting, and cooking process uh, may interact with each other and lead to colon cancer. So these are just a few examples why it is worthwhile to study much more intensively some other cancers. My personal suspicion is that the 21% of new cancers presently linked to infections will be increased in the future. And if you just take these two types of cancers, which I mentioned a moment ago, they would immediately come up to something like 35% of cancers linked to infection. Pointing clearly that this is a very important group of agents, of carcinogenic cancer-producing agents, which need to be better studied. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so the next question. Um, could you please clarify if there are any other preventive measures provided by the HPV vaccine and where this research is going? Okay, um, could you please clarify um, the other preventive measures provided by the HPV vaccine and where the research is going? Stage, the available vaccines protect, protect against two types of HPVs, which cover about 70% of cervical cancers, namely the type 16 covering f more than 50% and 18 covering slightly less than 20% of cervical cancers. There's some cross-protection against three other types, 31, 33, and 45. So probably the protective effect goes up to 80%, but clearly the vaccines do not cover all types uh, which cause cervical cancer, particularly some of the types C in Asia, like 52 and 58, are not completely covered. There are present vaccines uh, in clinical trials which are supposed to contain nine types, and they probably will be more protective, close, coming close to 90, 95%. Um, this even a chance that in the future, due to a specific type of development, vaccines will come up which protect against all types in the general tract and probably even against cutaneous. That still remains some more clinical studies and we will see it in the future. But clearly, there's some work going on along those lines. Thank you. <laughs> Since HPV vaccines can be expensive, is there a plan, for instance, by the UN to target these vaccines to LEDCs? Sorry, there's some kind of echo. Since HPV vaccines are expensive, is there a plan, for instance, by the United Nations to 
target these vaccines to LEDCs? Uh, well, there are even major efforts running right now, particularly in some of the high-risk areas for cervical cancer, to provide the vaccines even for almost no money, for, uh, sponsored in part by the Gates Foundation, in part by some of the big uh, international organizations. But in a way, as we say in German, it's a, on a hot stone. You know, it's because the demand is so high globally that these types of foundations are not able to cover it. I think the optimal aspect would be really if uh, the companies would come up with much cheaper prices on the one end, and if some additional competing companies would arise which produce these vaccines as well and uh, under those for a cheap price and that clearly would lead to a worldwide drop in prices. But this is clearly something which is highly desirable. Thank you. How does the vaccine reach out to women in countries where women have limited rights? <laughs> um, how can women in countries where they have limited rights access the vaccine? Okay, um, how can the vaccine be accessed by women in countries where they have limited rights? We have, to, we have to state that it is really true that, in, that some countries are presently not able to afford the vaccine completely since the prices are too high. There's of course one other mode of, preventive, of prevention of cervical cancer by the so-called pap smear, which is called a secondary prevention. The pap smear is the uh, material which is taken uh, by a vaginal smear, which is analyzed for the development of or for the presence of precancerous cells and if they are there then in a subsequent investigation lesions are being seen and then usually if they are advanced surgically removed so this by this way in many countries where the pap smear is done on a large scale uh, about 75 to 80 percent of cervical cancers are being prevented but of course, not all countries have the infrastructure, not all countries have the necessary structure of cytolog cytolog cytological laboratories, and uh, even this is rather wishful thinking that it should be done everywhere. So in a way, we need to develop structures, particularly in parts of the developing world, for either the secondary prevention or primary prevention. Primary prevention has, of course, the advantage that the precursor lesions, which may need and require surgical removal, are no longer are also prevented. The uh, surgical removal of primary, of in secondary prevention, has a slight disadvantage of having some side effects, particularly for uh, premature deliveries, occasionally also a higher rate of abortions, and. Uh, and even a slightly increased childhood mortality shortly after delivery. So for all these reasons, in a way, prevention, primary prevention would be preferable. Hello. <laughs> okay. I can't see it from Hi. here because of um, my question is, uh, I read about you, um, that you kind of went against the norm researching uh, this HPV vaccine, this HPV virus. So I'm just wondering uh, what motivated you to do so when there were so many people who did agree with you. What motivated me was clear the conviction that we were right. <laughs> uh, doctor, over here. Do you do your 
research in the field of infection-induced cancer, have you found that there has been increased funding towards further research? And if not, what do you feel is preventing such funding? Well, I think you can observe it right now globally that there is an awakening interest in infections and cancer. In fact, it was true when I started it, there was very little interest at all. And there were even a number of rather well-known and famous people who said there's clearly evidence that infectious agents have nothing to do with cancer, which was, of course, wrong. So right now, many of the funding agencies, I can only state it for Europe and also to a limited degree for the United States and Canada, they're really more willing to support this type of research. Thank you. Hello. Here. Um, aside from discovering the vaccine, what was the most exciting part of the process for you? Oh, what was the most exciting part of the research activities? Yes. Uh, well, uh, I must say, there were two events which I found very exciting. One was initially when we could demonstrate that in a specific childhood lymphoma in Africa, the so-called Burkitt's lymphoma, and also nasopharyngeal carcinomas, which exist here in Southeast Asia quite frequently, that we could demonstrate the DNA of the Epstein-Barbars in each individual tumor cell. I found this quite exciting because it, in a way it seemed to underline our initial or my initial speculation during my student time, it turned out later on that it is more complicated than simply detecting the DNA. But nevertheless, it was a clear-cut hint that the virus plays a significant role in this type of condition. Uh, subsequently, the other exciting developments were indeed by discovering that specific genes of the uh, HPV, for the HPV 16 and 18 were necessary and responsible for the malignant growth of cervical cancer cells and that the inhibition of these genes converted cancer cells into a quasi type of normal cells. And we're not exactly normal, but they are no longer malignant cells under those circumstances, which pointed in fact indeed to the that these agents caused this type of cancer was, in my opinion, the most direct evidence for this. So a couple of other things, uh, working on different virus systems and finding a couple of novel types of agents which do not belong into the same category, but this always has been quite exciting and interesting. So I always felt it was an exciting field. If I'm asked whether I would do it again, I would say yes. Hi. I'd like to ask you what has been the most difficult part in this journey of developing uh, this, vac this vaccine, the, H the HPV vaccine? What was the most difficult part? Yes. Oof, the most difficult part was the unavailability of simple techniques which would have permitted us at an early stage to isolate the respective types of the genetic materials of the DNA of these viruses to characterize it, which was clearly facilitated by subsequent developments of techniques which permitted today relatively easily and quite regularly to do so, particularly when you know the agents for which you are searching for. And uh, so far, I would say between the years 72 to 79, for a period of seven years, it was uh, quite difficult to find clear-cut clues that the speculation which we, have, which we were following the hypothesis said it is, is correct, in spite of the fact that in these years there existed already some data on animal systems, where, for instance, in uh, certain types of in rabbits, uh, what like viruses caused cancer under specific circumstances. In basically, these data were already published in the 1930s of the past century. And also there were upcoming dates in cattle that the bladder cancer might have been linked to papilloma virus infection. So this all looked supportive, but it didn't clarify the field. So for years, for the years, it was quite difficult indeed. Hi, 
I, um, in your point of view, is virus a living organism or not? And whether if it's living or if, it, if it's not living, how can we like exclude them from us? Like, how can we totally destroy them <laughs> like that? I'm not entirely sure whether I caught your question completely. Is virus a living organism or not? Oh, oh, well, virus and is a living organism or not? Well, virus is a living organism when it lives in another cell. Otherwise, it's clearly like, a, like an organic material. Outside of, the, of a living cell, a virus cannot replicate. It's not doing anything. Uh, viruses are probably nothing else but uh, some, as we say, genes which uh, become uh, not, no longer responsive to the regulatory mechanisms of the cells. They develop from cells as independ independent functions uh, in, within the cells. They do no longer um, obey to some signals which are exerted by the uh, individual cells and developed in addition some kind of protein shell which protects them and permits them to pass from one cell to the other and disturbs the functions of cells. Viruses are clearly developments of living cells. There's no good evidence that viruses are, let's say, early ancestors of cells. They are derivatives from cells in a way. And maybe let me make one additional statement right now. Cancer by viruses is in not a single case of advantage for the respective virus. It's usually of disadvantage for the respective agents because they acquire some modifications in the course of carcinogenesis which do no longer permit them to replicate <coughs> autonomously, to produce progeny under those circumstances. So in a way, cancer in these instances is an accident. It's an accident by the virus which happens, of course, more, more frequently if a large number of cells become infected in one single cell. It's, not, it's an accident for the host, of course, who acquires the disease and frequently dies of the disease. And in a way, for a short period of time, it might be of advantage for the cell because it now grows unlimited into the periphery and into the neighborhood of the respective cell, but in the end it's also a disaster for the cell as well because the organism is dying of the respective form of cancer. So cancer, you can consider it clearly as an accident which happens, statistically a rare event, but if you have many of the cells infected and if these infected cells require <coughs> later on additional mutational events, modifications in host cell genes, then the chances of acquiring cancer are bigger, but in each case, it's b a bad fate for the respective individual who acquires this disease. Thank you. Hello. Oh, what made you think that there was a link between HPV and cervical cancer in the first place? Uh, that was an old publication which appeared in 1842 where an Italian uh, physician noted in the mortality statistics of the city of Verona in Italy that uh, women who had several partners had a higher rate of cervical cancers than those where he supposed that they had either no partners or very few partners. He particularly looked at that time also into the situation of nuns. And in these cases, he concluded that cervical cancer has something to do with sexual contact. And this was followed by a number of reports in the, between the 1920s, 1960s, that uh, agents which are sexually transmitted may, cause a, uh, may play a role in the causation of this cancer, particular syphilis, gonorrhea, and a couple of others were investigated. None of these stu studies turned out to be conclusive. But uh, in the end of the 1960s, a specific virus was incriminated, herpes simplex type 2. And at that time, we had worked on Epstein-Barr virus, which is a virus belonging into the same group. And so we thought it's easy to prove the point where the herpes type 2 is also present in cervical cancer. We didn't find it. And I had already previously 
found a number of reports of the rare malignant conversion, malignant turnover of gentle warts into malignant tumors. And since I saw papilloma virus particles in these gentle warts myself in the electron microscope, I thought they might be good candidates. In the end, it turned out that they're not good candidates, but they helped us very much find the right agents because they are distantly related to the viruses and genital warts. Thank you. The HPV vaccine is a three-shot course, but what happens if you only complete two of these shots? HPV is on. The vaccine is a three course, it's a three-shot course, but yes. what happens if you only complete two of them? What happened to Z? What happens if you only take, if you only get two of the shots? Okay, uh, good question. Do you need really three shots of the HPV vaccine or is, are two shots, for instance, sufficient? Well, I cannot really completely answer the question because some studies are going on presently analyzing the role of two shots in comparison to three shots. Three shots clearly improve the level of antibodies in these cases and it's quite clear that at least for the period since the first clinical trial started about 10 years ago, there is sufficient protection still after this period of time for the vaccine. With two shots, antibodies in quite a number of instances are already relatively high, um, but we have no long-time follow-up studies to see whether they go down, fa go down faster uh, than with three shots, and that needs to be carefully evaluated. So I'm afraid I cannot fully answer your question, but it will come up, as the answer will come up in the forthcoming years. Thank you. Um, I was wondering how you were able to develop a vaccine with such a high effectiveness rate. Well, the vaccine was not developed by myself. It was developed by some companies who did really the work and also some other researchers contributed greatly to it as well. But just to tell you a little anecdote, in 1984 I visited plenty of German, Swiss companies and asked them to help us to develop a vaccine against this virus. And one company became very much interested in it, a bearing company in Germany, in Marburg. And, uh, but they belonged to another big pharmaceutical giant, Höchst, in Frankfurt. And uh, one of the directors of Höchst asked Behring to conduct a market analysis for the vaccine. And then the market analysis came out and stated that there was no market for this vaccine, couldn't be sold. Everyone would be infected anyway from childhood on with the same viruses. Both statements were entirely wrong. And it took really, uh, that left us in deep frustration because the sponsorship was immediately uh, off, went immediately off. And uh, it took a couple of years, it was until 1980-89, before two American companies finally picked it up again and were willing to produce a vaccine. And so then, of course, the techniques were also, also a little bit more advanced and they have been quite successful. I think they sell now, they sold now, several hundred billions of doses of the vaccines, and for them it's really big business. Um, has there been any controversies in taking the vac vaccine that might make people not want to take it? Well, there were initially a number of reports that the vaccine has a number of side effects. Even death cases were reported after vaccination. And uh, none of these cases, I tried to follow up those which were accessible to me, none of these cases have been linked to the vaccination as well. In Germany, for instance, we have 50 cases of unexplained deaths per year in the age group between 15 and 20 years of age. Of course, in each case, a tragic event. Um, in the sequence of the HP introduction of the HPV vaccine, this rate rather dropped, it didn't increase, but not statistically, not significantly. And uh, there's careful investigations, particularly conducted in Australia, where a very high percentage of the girls, more than 80% in the eligible ages, have been vaccinated, demonstrates that you can roughly calculate that there's one side effect among 100,000 vaccine doses. And the side effect is an allergy against a protein in the vaccine. 
this rate of 1 to 100,000 is lower than a couple of side effects of rates of the vaccines which we presently apply to small children. And I'm not arguing against the vaccines in small children, of course they're important, but it shows that this vaccine is one of the safest and most efficient vaccines we know of. If you vaccinate people against HPV, you get an antibody response in about 100% of the vaccinated children. If you vaccinate against hepatitis B virus, there are always 5 to 10% of non-responders who do not develop antibodies, and we still do not know why this is the case, but they are still infectable by the agent. So in a way, even in that sense, it's very highly effective. Um, in the press, there were enormous numbers of side effects which have been reported, and there was a, a German group at the Max Planck Institute in Berlin who investigated the press reports, and they found out that among 220 press reports, there was only one which was related to the actual data which were published and which were demonstrated by other groups. So it's a safe vaccine and a highly efficient vaccine, but there's no vaccine without any side effects without any risk. Every vaccine has a small risk, but think of the disease and you have to put it into relation to the risk which you acquire when you get the disease. What do you think will, uh, what do you think will happen if the virus mutates into something more dangerous? And the virus? Mutates into something more dangerous. I'm sorry, I don't get it. Uh, if the virus mutates into another virus which is more dangerous. Well, that risk is, is fortunately for papillomavirus is extremely low because this is a virus group which mutates only at an extremely low rate. We can roughly calculate even after the divergence of modern humans or humans from uh, apes, or the old world apes, that the mutation rate between these viruses, since they're with us since more than the early days of our own evolution, that the rate of mutation must be very low because these apes contain some agents which are closely related, for instance, to HPV-16. with relatively few modifications, whereas HPV-16 and some of our cutaneous papillomaviruses are much more distantly related to each other. So the mutation rate over this enormously long period in, in time was relatively low. Clearly, there occur mutations, but they occur at a low rate. It's not comparable to hepatitis C virus or HIV. So this risk is extremely low that something like this is going to happen. Thank you. Um, this has been an incredible information session, Professor Hausen. On behalf of the high school of ISB, I'd just like to thank you so much for your valuable time. I'm sure your incredible dedication to the field of science has inspired many of the aspiring doctors and scientists here in the audience today. Please accept this gift as a token of our gratitude and as a reminder of your many admirers, admirers here in the Kingdom of Thailand. Um, for, could all the people who ask questions please come up to take photos? If you asked a question, uh, can you come up to the stage please? We'd just like to get one little photo call of Professor Housen. Students, please remain seated. Other students remain seated, thank you.
Okay, thank you. Once again, warm.